can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. Does this mean we as individuals should not have a will for ourselves? Well, you are supposed to have lost your will for yourself when you declared Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Now the meaning of Lord is master. One who takes charge of your life. That means you will only live according to his will. So when you receive salvation and declared Jesus to be Lord, you submitted your will. To his will now to have your own will anymore means a rejection of his lordship so you're not supposed to have your own will you're supposed to find out about his will and live according to his will that's why he's lord of your life otherwise he's not lord of your life so that's very important for you biblical that some illnesses are inherited if yes what do i do to break away you don't need to break away the bible says if any man being christ he's a new creation all things are passed away and all things have become new what you have to do is stand your ground that you're a new creation and your your life comes from christ not from your earthly uh, biological uh, roots don't trace yourself to them trace yourself to christ and if you trace yourself to christ there's no inherited disease. So stand on God's word. School. But I lack the courage to approach people. I also sometimes feel like people will not listen to me. But deep inside me, I want to do the work of the Father. Please help me out. All right. Your answer is in Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you always be bold. You started the book of Acts, you find that the apostles were made bold by the Spirit. They were emboldened by the Spirit. They were emboldened by the Spirit. The Bible says, if you speak in tongues, in, let me read that to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Or he that prophesied edifieth the church. Now, the word edifieth means also emboldens. It means the one who speaks in tongues emboldens himself. 
The more you speak in tongues, the more your spirit is stirred, stirred in the Holy Ghost. And you are emboldened. Now you remember that Simon Peter was timid before he received the Holy Spirit. At the crucifixion of Jesus, he denied Jesus. When Jesus was arrested, he denied knowing Jesus. He was so timid. He was called Simon, a reed, shaken by the wind. But then when he received the Holy Spirit, he became bold in spite of the large crowd present on the day of Pentecost. Peter was fearless and he addressed the crowd boldly because he had received the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe you have received the Holy Spirit already. And that's why I'm reading to you from Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 where it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So be filled with the Spirit. Be drunk with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, something you do says here speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God these are the things you practice in being filled with the Spirit and I tell you you will be bold to share the word of God it will happen through the Holy Ghost. My main ministry is healing, but it did not teach me how to go about it to make it happen. Pastor, please help by giving the steps to make this become a reality. Thank you. Well, one of the things you need to understand about, he, about ministry is that we don't just do ministry. Ministry actually is a gift from God that works through us. See, so if God has actually called you into any area of ministry, you never have to worry about what are the steps to take to make that ministry become a reality. What you do is serve God with your life according as you've been serving him you serve God with your spirit and as you serve God do the things of God live your life for God when so just do the things that he's told us to do generally the ministry to which he called you will work through you it will be produced through you it will find vent through you the ministry will come alive so um, you don't need the steps to make to make that become a reality. It will work through you if it's there. If the calling of God is in your life, it will work out. But I don't think I have received my healing yet. How do I take advantage of the healing power? You know, I mean, it's like... A somebody's read the Bible and just because the Bible is a book about salvation and just because somebody read the Bible doesn't mean that he would receive salvation and I'm glad the way you put it I don't think I have received my healing yet because there's a giving part and there's a receiving part God has given it's yours to receive you see no matter what we write it cannot be better than the Bible the Word of God because all the truths that we draw comes from the Word of God the Bible and if reading the Bible hasn't made someone to receive salvation, there's no reading of any book that can make you receive anything. Receiving from God is an act of your faith. You see, it's an act of your faith. You've got to do something about it. And I would recommend another book, How to Make Your Faith Work. You know, a lot of Christians who have faith, and they don't know how to put their faith to action, how to make their faith work. And that's the reason for that book. The title again is How to Make Your Faith Work. It's one of the best books you can find on making your faith work. So I recommend that to you. It'll teach you a lot about your faith. It'll teach you about the different kinds of faith. And it'll let you know how to make your faith work. So get that book. <music> of oil to a Christian who is sick 
James chapter 5 from verse 14 to 15 says, that he's given us that reference. And it says, does it mean that if I am sick, I can buy olive oil and anoint myself, believing God for a miracle? No, that's not what it talks about. And that's not what it talks about. And first of all, using oil for the anointing of the sick is actually the ministry of the babe, the babe in Christ. You see, that's what the Bible shows us. They haven't yet understood that the Holy Spirit has come and, has, and, and is carrying out his ministry in our lives today. So there has to be the ministry through the senses by uh, using the oil, which is representative of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is symbolic of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oil was used as a symbol of the anointing. Now, when the real thing has come, why must you wait for the symbol? See, but that is used for ministering to babes in Christ. That's why he said, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. You see, let him call for the elders. He didn't say, I mean, the elders are not supposed to get sick. That's another this subject. But you see, he says, let him call for the elders. So um, he's referring to those who are still babes in the Lord. And he says, let them pray over, over him, anointing him with oil. He didn't say, let him anoint himself with oil. See, if you can believe enough for the oil, why don't you believe in the Holy Spirit then? See, so um, the significance of the oil is that it is symbolic of the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is a, a, a ministry to the sick that came right from the Old Testament. See, they used oil in ministering to the sick. The disciples anointed people who were sick, but Jesus never did it. And Jesus didn't send them to use the oil. See, Jesus didn't anoint anybody with oil, neither did he send his disciples to do so. But the disciples did have oil. Why? Because the elders of the Jews, that's the way they prayed. That's the way they, they ministered to sick people, you see. And so uh, remember here, James was the, the, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he did mix at the time, he did mix his Christianity with some Judaism because um, he didn't want to get into trouble with those who were into the circumcision. That's what the Bible tells us. See, so there's no big wonder that he mixed this up. So it's not a recommendation to us at all. When you grow in Christ, you put away childish things. Does this mean we as individuals should not have a will for ourselves? Well, you were supposed to have lost your will for yourself when you declared Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Now, the meaning of Lord is master. One who takes charge of your life. That means you will only live according to his will. So when you received salvation and declared Jesus to be Lord, you submitted your will to his will. Now, to have your own will anymore means a rejection of his lordship so you're not supposed to have your own will you're supposed to find out about his will and live according to his will that's why he's lord of your life otherwise he's not lord of your life so that's very important for you in god's healing Lots of people have questioned me about 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, saying that God still does not heal 100%. He still directs you to a doctor who in turn heals your medication. Please, could you be so kind as to explain this to me? Thank you so much. Well, if anybody said that God doesn't heal 100%, he still directs you to a, a, a medical doctor who in turn heals by medication. Where did they get the information from? How did they know that? When Jesus healed, they were perfectly healed. Don't you know what it is to be made whole? The Bible says they were made whole. To be made whole means to be perfectly healed. It means that they were restored and they have become completely normal. So God heals perfectly. But then, they given you a scripture that you mentioned, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23, and I want to read that to you. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, this was Paul writing to the young man Timothy. 
And he said to him, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. What's that got to do with medical science? He didn't say, go to the doctor. He didn't say that. Now, we're not against doctors and medicine. The point is, we're dealing with the context. In this verse 23 that you cited, he didn't say, go to the doctor to finish the job that God started. That's not what he said. He said, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. That's what he said. He wasn't dealing with medication here. So, the, in the first instance, the scripture they're giving you for their argument is wrong. And to say that God doesn't heal 100%, he directs it to a doctor. What you're trying to say is, oh, God, you know, he can't get, he can't get the job done. He needs somebody else to actually fix it. The Bible says they were made whole. If they were made whole then, they can still be made whole now. Are the diseases we suffer acts of the devil? Are they evil spirits or demons? If they are, how come the doctors cure them but do not have the Holy Spirit? Well, first and foremost, it's, it's important for you to know that it's not every sickness that is directly from the devil. Sometimes there are different things that happen to people. And, uh, and Jesus never even gave us the impression that all sicknesses and diseases were directly connected with Satan. Of course, he has a remote uh, involvement in it because um, he was the cause of it from the very beginning. Because the Bible tells us, through sin, death came into the world. And sickness is incipient death. You see? So, otherwise, it would have not been possible for you to be sick at all. But then your question is, if Satan has something to do with it, how come doctors are able to cure them? Well, another very important thing you need to know is that Satan is not omnipotent. He doesn't have all the power. He can't control all of nature. So no matter what he does, we still have some power. We still have some influence in our own lives as individuals. We can exercise our authority. For example, if you study uh, in the scripture, you find there's a story about a man who was demon possessed in Gadara. The Bible tells us he had a legion of devils. And as Jesus came by that street, the Bible says the man ran towards Jesus. See, even though he had the devils in him, he ran towards Jesus. Now the devils didn't make him go to Jesus. If they had anything to do with it, they would have wanted him not to go there. But they couldn't stop the man from running towards Jesus. Even though he was demon possessed. I mean, that's about how far it gets when demons can control that man's life to a large extent. See, so even people who are demon possessed are not 100% controlled by the devil because the individual has a will of his own. Now, when you understand that, you can understand that no matter what the devil does, we still have some power, some influence. Because human beings were made to be higher than angels. Especially when you consider that these demons are fallen angels see so um even though you have if satan has done something you can undo what satan has done to a large extent you can undo it let's as assume that satan caused a man to have an accident let's even assume that he was so possessed he had an accident and he damaged his car you can take the car for the repairs and satan can't stop the repair of the car you see you can fix the car even if your your tires got deflated through a satanic manipulation. How come you can fix the car? See, why can't Satan stop you from fixing the car? If Satan had all the power that many people think he does, he would have killed everybody. So why hasn't he done it? He would like to. The reason he hasn't done it is because he can't. So that proves Satan doesn't have, the, have all the power. And so we can, a lot of times, undo a lot of what the devil has done when we understand how. But in many things, even in medical science, they don't understand. They don't have all the answers. And where they don't have the answers, they are unable to do anything about it. So we don't at all uh, imply that when the devil has done something, we can't undo it. No. See, man was raised 
or, or made to have more power than satanic forces you see but because he fell back there in the garden he lost his authority and so Jesus Christ has come to give us authority in his name so that what we are unable to do by human ability we can do in his name which is higher than human ability so you can do a lot as a human being and that's why the doctors can also do a lot and they will do more but then where they fail we can do much more God, I strongly believe in God and always carry out my prayers three times a day in favor of obtaining mercy and to receive total healing from a chronic incurable disease. What level of faith do you need to receive healing from such a condition? I have faith and I even fast, but it seems to be failing though I believe that God will set me free one day. You know, it's amazing that you're saying that you have faith here. And at the same time, you're saying that you believe that God will set you free one day. The problem is, you, you haven't been able to distinguish between faith and hope. What you have is not faith. What you have is hope. Because the Bible says faith is calling real and calling done what we have hoped for. We count it done now. It's like a, the title deed to a property. You see, you have the title deed. You don't have to be in the property to know it's yours, even though you haven't been to the property. So faith is the title deed. And um, that's what you've got to do. You've got to lay claims to that which belongs to you. You have to de declare that what you have, the, the healing that you have been expecting or asking the Lord for has become real. Remember what Jesus said. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. And he shall have them. See? So, but if you're hoping that God will set you free one day, that is not faith. Even though you believe it. It's not going to work. Because that's hope. Hope is to look at something coming in the future. Hope is to put your expectation into the future. Faith is to declare that it is real and to live in the reality of it now. So there's a big difference between the two. And that's the reason, even though you've been praying and fasting and hoping, it's not working. Because for this to change, it's got to be faith. Your hope must become faith. Your believing must become faith. And this is one of the problems that a lot of God's children have found themselves in. You know, they believe and they hope. And then there's no change. And they wonder why. Because believing will not change your situation believing will make you accepted toward god your heart will be accepted by god the bible says with the heart man believes unto righteousness that means we believe and are made right with god see but your faith is what will change the situation if you want your situation to change it's got to be faith believing will not change the situation believing will make you give you a heart that is accepted of god that's why you know in your heart that God loves you. You know in your heart that God accepts you. But your situation has not changed. Because what will change it is faith. Why do some people get healed and others don't? Well, I love you too, Kamel. Why do some people get healed and others don't? Um, Kamel, it is true some people get healed and others don't. And that is, one, it's not a function of God. It's not a function of um, the severity of, of the sickness or the longevity. But it's a function of the individual that is sick. Because um, it's a question of the individual knowing having the knowledge of what has been accomplished for him in Christ Jesus with respect to his or her health and knowing how to recognize the power of God, the healing power when it's available. Because God is not trying to heal you. He's not trying to heal anyone right now. 
he's already done it all the all the all the christian needs or the sick person needs is to go receive his or her healing so if one doesn't know how to recognize the healing power or doesn't know how to receive healing even when the healing power is present he wouldn't receive healing and i think this is the reason some receive healing and others don't in the same meeting you know i i wonder why some people like to ask this question of course it's a, it's a genuine question but um think about it this way why is it that when we preach and uh, there are sinners why do some give their hearts to christ and others don't in the same meeting you may have a thousand people there some people will give their hearts to christ and some wouldn't now by the way that's the greatest miracle when a man is born again so why do some receive that miracle that we call the greatest miracle and others don't they heard the same thing they were in the same place the same grace was made available some gave their hearts to christ others went home the same way they came why was it because god was partial was it because god wanted to save some and they want to save some not at all not at all because the same salvation goes for everybody and it's not god trying to save man it's man trying to receive from god what he's already done so that's what evangelist is explaining to you it's it's not god trying to heal one person and not healing the other just as in the same way god is not trying to save one man and not save the other because he's already given salvation to everybody and he says whosoever will may come see so um if you hear the word faith comes to you and then you act your faith salvation results the same thing happens when it concerns healing when you hear god's word faith comes to you faith is a tool and with that tool in your hand as it were you can create whatever it is that you want from god you can make happen for yourself whatever it is you desire so you find that sometimes when people receive the word of god they don't mix it with faith and if you don't mix it with faith you don't get nothing see always mix the word with faith anybody can be healed irrespective of the situation it doesn't matter how long you've suffered it depends on how you can receive that faith you know some people say i don't have faith i don't know how to believe god well it's very simple when you hear the word of god coming to you you accept it as the word of god receive it it will produce its own result by giving you faith the bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so when you hear the word it will produce faith in you you won't have to squeeze up some faith it will produce faith inside you so that's why we preach that's why we preach the word so that men can hear it and receive faith and then they can act their faith for without faith the bible says in hebrews 11 verse 6 without faith it is impossible to please god he that cometh to god must be why do people lose their healing the Bible says God's gifts are freely given without repentance. Will God permit that an individual's healing be taken from him for any reason? <laughs> God doesn't take anybody's healing because he's not the cause of anybody's sickness. He doesn't take healing from anybody. But why do people lose their healing then if God doesn't take it away? Several reasons. Now, I would like us to look into the scriptures. The first reason is a withdrawal, a withdrawal from faith, a withdrawal from truth, a withdrawal. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Remember, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's Hebrews 11, 6. It says it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, he says, the just shall live by faith. But if any man withdraw, draw back, withdraw, he says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So, 
when you receive healing from God through the word or by the Holy Ghost, it, it usually would be from an act of your faith. But then, if you withdraw, if you change from faith, you can lose the healing. I'll give you a simple example of such withdrawal. The Bible talks about Jesus walking on the water, coming to the disciples who were in the boat. And then when they found out it was Jesus, Peter actually cried out and said, um, well, Jesus said, be not afraid, I'm the one. And Peter said, if you're the one, ask me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water to go to Jesus. He actually walked on water. But then the Bible says in the 30th verse, that when he saw the winds boisterous, that means violent, strong and violent wind, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And then Jesus said, the Bible says, Jesus got him immediately, got a hold of him immediately and said, why did you doubt? You see, he actually started right. He actually started the miraculous life, the miraculous walk. He was walking on water to go to Jesus. But then when he saw something, he saw a frightful sight. That wind staring up great waves. He became afraid. He became afraid. So his faith, he withdrew from that faith that he had when he was walking on water. S same thing that happens to people when they get healed. Maybe there's a counter attack of the devil and um, they notice some of the symptoms they used to have and then they become afraid. Or for some signs, something happens and they become afraid. Or they hear something. Maybe in the news. Or they heard of someone who died of that thing and they become afraid. Fear stares the power of the enemy. And this has made many to lose their healings. The second thing for which reason people lose healings is sin. You know, Jesus healed a man in St. John's Gospel, chapter number 5. And I want to read to you. And this man couldn't walk. He was sick for 38 years. I read from verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw, saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. You know, somebody said one time that uh, uh, 38 years doesn't really mean 38 years. That's nonsense. It's 38 years. And that's why Jesus said he'd been a long time in that condition. And in scriptural language, especially the King James language of um, uh, timing and counting, he puts it in the tens and then in the units. He would say uh, 30 and 5 for 35. All right? 40 and 2 for 42. That's what it means. So 30 and 8 years would mean 38 years. And that's why Jesus said it was a long time. It had been a long time in that condition. A long time. Not that he, he had it twice. No. Not for 30 years and then later on another 8 years. No. He had been a long time. That's what Jesus said. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. Not certain times in that case or sometimes in that case. A long time. One long time. One long period. That means the 30 and 8 years will come together. 38 years. 38 years in that case he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And you know, this man was healed. And he walked. Now, let's go down to verse, um, verse 14. Afterward, you know, the man didn't really know who Jesus was. I I'll give that to you from uh, verse 13. And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. He knew Jesus. 
In verse 14 it says, Afterward Jesus founded him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. You see that? Jesus told the man, Don't sin again. Otherwise, something worse could come to you. So sin is one reason people lose their healing. They go back to sin. And so Jesus said, sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. The third reason people lose their healings is negative words, negative talking, wrong talking. So I, I'm, I'm going to explain that to you. And the gentleman, uh, a Kengaki from Cameroon, I told you, you benefit from some of the question and, and that's what I'm getting into right now. So I said the third reason is negative talking. I want to read to you from Proverbs chapter number 15. From verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now this is so important. He says a wholesome tongue, a healing tongue is a tree of life. But it says a, a wholesome tongue. The word translated wholesome there is mape. And it means healing. A healing tongue is a tree of life. Then it says, But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Perverseness is translated from a word that also means contrariness. It means being negative. Speaking contrary words. When you say words that are contrary to your healing. Contrary to um, God's word in your life. He says, is a breach in the spirit. So in the realm of the spirit, there's a breach, there's a wound, there's a destruction. Which will sooner or later manifest itself in a physical body. So negative talking, contrary speaking, is one of the reasons people lose their healings. Now, this is so important. Sometimes, you know, um, before, you got, before you got sick, you may have been well. For many people, they were well before they got sick, especially those who weren't born with a certain condition. They were well before they got sick. But lifestyle matters. Sometimes the wrong lifestyle can lead to sickness. The wrong lifestyle. And that's why you've got to make some adjustments in your life. There are some things you just can't handle at certain times in your life. And there's some things you may have overdone. There are things you may have overeaten. There's some things you may have overdone in your life. And you would need to straighten up. So when you get healed, go back and look at your life. And change your lifestyle. Dirty habits and so on. So um, that's one of the reasons that people lose their healings. Wrong lifestyle. They go back to some of the things that brought the sickness in the first place. The lastly, and very, very important as well, is the fact that some healings are actually miraculous signs. For example, one can receive healing in a meeting where the, the power of God is being manifested. There are signs and wonders. And... That healing could be a miraculous sign to get your attention. And so, what you do is to uh, respond in faith to make that healing permanent. Because the sign is for a purpose, is to get your attention. And once you receive that kind of a healing, you've got to respond in faith. That's why sometimes in crusades, in big healing meetings... People get healed because the, the minister of God has come to preach and there, there, there needs to be some signs to prove his message is from God. And so he prays and then there's this manifestation of healing and people get healed. And then maybe an hour later, the sickness returns. The pain comes back. The blindness returns and they say, oh, oh, these miracles are not real. No, they were real, but they were signs. See, there were signs to get your attention. So once such a healing takes place in your body, the sign was to get your attention to God so you can respond to him in faith. From then on, you declare his reality in your life. You declare his healing and his blessing in your life. You've got to accept what he's done for you. Otherwise, you might lose it. So these are reasons why people lose their healings. 
And I trust that you can make whatever God has given to you permanent. Remember, when God blesses you, your responsibility is to keep it. It's not his job to keep it for you. It's your responsibility to keep it. Does this mean we as individuals should not have a will for ourselves? Well, you were supposed to have lost your will for yourself when you declared Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Now the meaning of Lord is master. One who takes charge of your life. That means you will only live according to his will. So when you receive salvation and declared Jesus to be Lord, you submitted your will. To his will now to have your own will anymore means a rejection of his lordship so you're not supposed to have your own will you're supposed to find out about his will and live according to his will that's why he's lord of your life otherwise he's not lord of your life so that's very important for you from Zimbabwe is it possible to have faith for someone to be healed or is it a personal thing yes it is possible to have faith for someone to be healed you've got to remember the cases in the Bible uh, the first one I'd like to read to you from St. Matthew's Gospel chapter number 8 from verse 5 St. Matthew's Gospel chapter 8 and when Jesus was added into Capernaum there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lied at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shalt come under my roof. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it when Jesus heard it he marveled and said to them that followed verily I say unto you I have not found so great faith no not in Israel and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth and Jesus said unto the centurion go thy way and as thou hast believed so be it on unto thee and his servant was healed in the self same hour the servant of the centurion never met jesus never talked with jesus never heard from jesus on whose faith then was he healed on his master's faith the centurion's faith jesus said the centurion had great faith and said as thou hast believed be it done unto you who believed the centurion believed on whose behalf his servants behalf, and got healing for his servant so you can you you can you can stand in faith and get healing for your loved one now another example is in St. Matthew's gospel chapter number 15 and I'm reading to you from verse 21 then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon and behold a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy on me O Lord thou son of David my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she cried after us they were getting embarrassed but he answered and said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel that's what Jesus said to the woman then came she and worshipped him saying Lord help me but he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now remember, she wanted healing. She wanted deliverance for her daughter. Her daughter wasn't with her. She came crying after Jesus and asking for help. Well, verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith great is thy faith be it unto thee even as thou wilt and her daughter was made whole from that very hour 
See, this was on the basis of her faith. Not her daughter's faith, but her own faith. So you can actually receive healing for your loved one. We had four questions for you, and um, these were What are the gifts of healing? What language do the angels understand? Is abortion a sin in God's eyes? Should Christians take medicine? And you chose Should Christians take medicine? Is it wrong for a Christian to take medicine? Would it be considered a faithless act? The question is why do you take medicine? Okay Let's look at it for a moment. Why do you eat? You eat frequently. You eat every day. Why do you eat? Do you eat just because if I don't eat, I'm going to die? No. You eat because it's necessary for the development of the body. Not because you think if you don't eat this afternoon, you're going to die. Not because you think if you don't eat this week, you're gonna die. You don't die this week because you didn't eat the whole week. No. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, you know that it's not everything that you eat that's good for the body. You might eat something just because you like it. Doesn't mean that it, it's nourishing to the body. So what is medicine then? medicine is the consumption or the use of certain materials that are edible or that can be introduced into the body and accommodated by the body to effect a cure it's another way of nourishing the body it's another way of helping the body you know get in what may be lacking which probably didn't come enough through food or because of some condition of your body your body couldn't get it from the food that's what it's all about otherwise when people are not sick and they eat normally the body remains healthy until something goes wrong so taking medicine is a good idea it's not wrong at all but now here's the problem in the same way that you don't just eat because oh you're gonna die you eat you don't have a problem eating but there are people who have a problem eating there are people who depend so much on food they want the food they go for it they have faith in the food it's like if i don't eat today i don't know what's gonna happen to me. so they are completely gone overboard as far as eating is concerned they eat more than others they take more than other people and that's a problem. You discover the problem in their weight, or you discover the problem in some uh, dysfunction in the body. Same thing about medicine. If you are taking medicine because your life depends on it, then you're wrong. Because you're putting your faith in the medicine. Like a man who puts his faith in the food. Like if I don't eat, I'm going to die. My whole life is on this food. Your whole life is not on this food. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Same thing with medicine. Man shall not be healed by medicine alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, medicine is God's idea because he taught in the Old Testament. He taught the priests on what to do to effect a cure in the bodies of those who were sick. And through the scriptures, you find several times where he mentioned the use of certain uh, uh, parts of the plants for medicine. So God's not against medicine, it's his idea. But don't put your faith in medicine. But the other thing is, if you take medicine without thinking it's going to work, then it's also useless. It's like eating without thinking it's going to work. It'll work, but your faith is in God. You see, you trust God that this medicine will work in your body because God 
will work in your body through this day as he will do with food. As you develop in your life, you discover that you don't have to put your faith or your trust in anything but God. But God. So, that's what it's all about. Nothing is wrong with medicine. Nothing is wrong. We might as well decide that we're going to wait for Elijah's chariot of fire to transport us from one place to the other instead of using a car. See, Elijah was transported by a chariot of fire. The Bible tells us about Philip, the evangelist, who was translated from one place to another by the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, it happened to Elijah as well. So we might as well say, okay, I'm going to stand at the bus stop and just expect the Spirit of God to go move me from here to my place of work. Now, is that impossible? Absolutely not. God can do that. His word shows he can do that. But why aren't we doing it? Because we can just get a car and go. And he's provided you with a car. There's nothing wrong with using, using medicine. You can use medicine. But don't put your faith in that. Don't put your trust in that as the uh, solution to your health problems. No matter what you do, even though you eat every day, you know God owns life. The food doesn't bring you life. The medicine will not sustain your life. God will sustain your life to his world. First one is from Mata. Mata is from Ireland. Dear Pastor, I want to know if you can pray in tongues when you're praying for the sick or interceding for someone because I know the word says the one who prays in tongues builds himself up. Yeah, it's true that the Bible tells us that the one who prays in an unknown tongue or actually the one who speaks in an unknown tongue uh, builds himself up. And speaking in tongues will include whether you are bringing forth a message in tongues or you are praying to God in tongues. Now, there's a slight difference between the two. And I want to read to you from the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 from verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. He says the one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God. Now, in verse 3, But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and excitation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edified himself. But he that prophesied edified the church. Then, notice what it says here. I will that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now that means that when you speak in tongues, it says you're speaking to God because nobody understands you. Only God understands you. And so when you speak, to God you're speaking mysteries these are things unknown to the natural mind and to the ordinary man but you're speaking to God then he says the one who prophesies speaks to men to edification excitation and comfort the speaking to men the edifying the church because they bring forth prophecy in the understanding of the hearers then he says the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues except he interprets which means when you speak in tongues and interpret both will equal prophecy now that suggests to us that those tongues had a message for the people and so they had something to learn they were blessed by it which means you were not just speaking to God you're bringing forth a message to the people. So, in speaking in tongues, or speaking with tongues, there are two things. One is talking to God, and one is bringing forth a message to the people.
And when you bring forth a message to the people in tongues, there will necessarily have to be uh, the operation of the gift of interpretation. Otherwise, you are talking to God. And if you're talking to God, that's prayer. And that's why uh, later on in the, in the same book, in several, chapters, several verses down, um, from verse 13 it says wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret see it says let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret because when you interpret you may find that you're bringing forth a message because uh, speaking with tongues and interpreting those tongues will equal prophecy and uh, other people can learn so you'll not only be building yourself up you'll be building other people up through that uh, operation of the spirit that equals prophecy then he says in verse 14 for if i pray now he talks about prayer this is now talking to god if i pray in an unknown tongue my spirit prayed but my understanding is unfruitful what is it then i'll pray with the spirit and i'll pray with the understanding also i'll sing with the spirit and i'll sing with the understanding also else when thou shalt bless with the spirit how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest see so you get it here that there is the talking to god in tongues and there is the talking for the benefit of the people in tongues which will require interpretation so um, when you want to pray for someone it's important that you realize that you could actually be inspired to pray in other tongues and apart from the fact that that will build you, you might be inspired to pray in tongues and it will be a real prayer. So the one that builds you really is when you speak in those tongues and you're speaking between you and God. So that is for you. If it's got to do with someone else, then there's a, a interpretation required. For example, sometimes we found um, the, the operation of the spirit while we're speaking in tongues and then we bring forth the interpretation and that interpretation may be words to this effect you have been healed it's prophetic you spoke in tongues and you interpreted those tongues and then it was a prophecy to the sick and he got healed you could be speaking in tongues and interceding for someone and the words will come from the spirit of God letting you know what is going on and you can share that word with that person so uh, these are not things that you form or try to make happen but if you would let the spirit of god work through you you'd find these differences in the rhapsody of october Pastor Chris mentioned that God is not against medicine. So does that mean God is not against traditional medicine also? Well, God is not against any medicine. He's not against traditional medicine or whatever medicine. If medicine is medicine. Now the problem with some traditional medicines is the connection of the tradition mm. to their forebears, their ancestors or ancestral spirits or some demonic forces or some spiritual forces of some kind that is the problem where it's a juju priest who has to um, preside over these so-called medicines or they get their formula from some spiritual entity so that's what the problem is so understand god is not against medicine what makes it traditional I think it's a misnomer. What makes it traditional? Is it traditional because there is a tradition? Or is it traditional because it's got something to do with some traditional gods? So if it's the, the traditional god, then they got a problem. Okay? If they're connecting it, they're connecting it to some spirituality, there's a problem. But um, the word traditional itself is not supposed to give it a negative meaning or connotation so God is not against any medicine all right so remember this um, if you're going for what they call traditional medicine 
Remember, you're basing your faith or your expectation on some medicine by some fellow who didn't study nothing, and you don't know how they concocted those formula for you. That can be a terrible problem, as it's been for some people. You know, anybody can wake up and say, I know something, um, and, and start putting things together and say, it cures. And people are looking for help, so they go anywhere. So be careful. Um, we're not suggesting in any way that you go to what they call traditional medicines today. Hi, Pastor. Thanks for your answers. I want to know, can a woman have the gift of healing and do great things like you do? Or is it only the men that can do this? Well, yes, a woman can. The Bible tells us that um, God said, I part my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. On your sons and your daughters. He says they shall prophesy. Now, apart from prophesying, these works are done by the Spirit of God. And if it's by the Spirit and the Spirit was poured out upon the man and the woman, then they can do the same thing because um, Jesus said, it's the Spirit the spirit of your father that speaks through you. And secondly, he said, the works that I do, they're done by my father that dwells in me. So if that father dwells in you, that's the Holy Spirit. If he dwells in you as a lady, you can do the same thing. So it's got nothing to do with gender. It's all the power of the Holy Spirit. Does this mean we as individuals should not have a will for ourselves? Well, you were supposed to have lost your will for yourself when you declared Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. Now the meaning of Lord is master. One who takes charge of your life. That means you will only live according to his will. So when you receive salvation and declared Jesus to be Lord, you submitted your will. To his will now to have your own will anymore means a rejection of his lordship so you're not supposed to have your own will you're supposed to find out about his will and live according to his will that's why he's lord of your life otherwise he's not lord of your life so that's very important for you